going to be talking about how uh, it's in uh, total knee applications. Um, I uh, will disclose that I'm a consultant and uh, receive research support for, uh, from Wright Medical. Um, when we're talking about design goals, we've talked a little bit about uh, surgical technique. Certainly that's uh, exceedingly important. Um, but you really want to restore the anatomy, restore how the knee moves, uh, accommodate for the variable anatomy and deformities, um, and maximize fixation. Fixation is what's going to make this a long-term construct. <laughs> and the factors affecting fixation techniques include uh, implant design um, and uh, surgical um, variables, as well as what the patient brings to the table, their age, their activity level, their physiology, um, their uh, uh, morpho uh, how they're shaped, you know, if there's uh, ectomorphs or endomorphs. Uh, the issues with cement less fixation in knees, well, um, it's been kind of a mixed bag. Uh, uh, you have to achieve initial stability. Uh, you, you can't have the uh, implants migrate. Um, loose implants can become a wear generator. Um, when the knees are more constrained, they put more uh, pressure on the interfaces. Um, and uh, you have to have good uh, contact, good balance, good alignment. And long-term survivorship with cementless knees has uh, sometimes been pretty good in some series, but sometimes not so good. So what can we do to improve it? Um, because certainly eliminating something that is finite, cement is always going to fail. Uh, it's a finite or closed window. If something can be incorporated, and, and be kind of like a metallic bone that gets incorporated in the body and becomes one, it has a better chance of becoming an open window. So the ideal porous surfaces and joint replacement should have a high level of porosity. Um, it should be uh, high shear uh, tensile and compressive strength and it should be inert or bioactive. So the materials that we're talking about um, <coughs> should resemble a normal bone, normal trabecular bone. And uh, the one I'm gonna be talking about spe specifically is biofoam. There's also others. There's trabecular metal that's been uh, available. It's tantalum uh, foam since uh, 1997. And some uh, uh, um, other uh, fiber mesh and other uh, sintered beads and things like that. And some of the new players with uh, the uh, foam metals are Regenerex and titanium, or tritanium, excuse me. So the, the properties of biofoam or this highly porous uh, material are uh, 60 to 70% porous. Uh, it has pores and a lattice structure similar to trabecular bone. It's manufactured from a known entity, which is commercially pure titanium. It's osteoconductive and osteoinductive. It's got high friction to enhance that initial stability. And the compressive modulus is similar to bone. So the way these things kind of evolve is, is you get a good idea, <coughs> you test it in the lab, you do some animal studies and then do some clinical series. So the models that uh, have been used in, in this particular uh, uh, endeavor uh, were at Rush with a well-known uh, model. And um, the uh, performance measures are all uh, things required by the FDA. So the compressive uh, properties of this material, as you can see on the graph, is uh, between uh, trabecular and uh, uh, cortical bone. It, uh, it exhibited uh, the compressive moduli close to that of subchondral bone. And um, it has a very high coefficient of friction. Uh, you can tell just by looking at the material that uh, it, um, it's got that kind of uh, bite uh, from that, uh, <coughs> the uh, regular surfaces. Um, it provides a microscopic on-growth surface and that high friction, um, even just putting it on your, your clothes and things like that, it just kind of binds to it. Um, so it's got good mechanical properties, uh, certainly uh, comparable to uh, things like trabecular metal. Um, and uh, been well tested in the lab. Uh, what about the animal studies? Well, they were done at Rush with a model that's been used for a long time, uh, both uh, metaphyseal and um, uh, transcortical models, where you basically put these plugs and, um, and then uh, euthanize the uh, animal and look at the histology at various time frames. So in, uh, in uh, comparison to the uh, sintered beads, which also is a pretty good surface, you can see that the, the bone uh, gets into these interstices and goes right down to the substrate at six weeks. Uh, there were 32% more calcified bone, and there's the histology, and pretty impressive. Bone seems to like this stuff a lot. Um, <clears throat> the bond strength to uh, the substrate was more than double the FDA requirement. 
and uh, looking at the um, uh, diaphyseal model, the total bone in growth was significant, uh, significantly more than the center beads. Um, kind of reminds you of Charmin, where uh, this kind of shows you the wettability, how uh, <coughs> the uh, plasma or whatever fluid just kind of flows into it. And um, <coughs> again, it's got that uh, nice uh, <coughs> uh, high friction. So. Uh, this is kind of like the fantastic voyage. Those are mesenchymal stem cells, kind of like fractures heal. The, this uh, substrate um, acts as a scaffold and uh, brings uh, those bioactive uh, um, things uh, that promote neovascularization with the capillaries. The BMP gets uh, into uh, the act, uh, forming osteoblasts and uh, and promoting uh, early ingrowth. And once this occurs early on, it, uh, it's a long-lasting interface because it's not going to have any fibrous component to it. So, um, oops, can you advance the slide, please? Thank you. So the clinical results of um, non-cemented, again, there's been some good series, um, and there's been uh, some not-so-good series uh, with uh, uh, cement less results not as good as cemented. So why improve it? Well, it's because of the mixed clinical outcomes um, and, and the desire to do better. Um, materials like this, I think, can stimulate more rapid ingrowth um, and also that resistance to micromotion will provide a more durable uh, bone uh, implant interface. Um, the open porous structure can accommodate uh, the potential for biologic agents and the isoelasticity can prevent stress shielding, which I think is a, a significant uh, problem um, with uh, a lot of the implants we're using now. Um, achieving rigid initial fixation is the most important factor in prom promoting bone in growth. <clears throat> so this is, um, for instance, the tibial base plate with this uh, biofoam material and has uh, you know, some bells and whistles, some, some pegs and some screws, anything you can do to lock it down with multiple stem and fixation options. Uh, some things don't make sense, you know, um, some of the things we talked about earlier <coughs> with uh, some of the bills and things. Well, you know, this, this is where you call when you have a technical problem with your computer, you know, and, and not to say anything, that's India and, and uh, you know, we should be able to do some of that stuff here with uh, promoting science and math and, uh, and, and helping our, our own country achieve uh, things that it should. And, and so uh, the uh, metal foam parts with this material, which is uh, machinable, I think is an improvement and um, it establishes these quiet interfaces that, uh, that I think can be advantageous. And, and this doesn't make sense to me. This is a 27-year-old that I treated a few years ago with this uh, horrible post-traumatic knee. And uh, I, I used a cemented implant, and uh, forgive me for not putting the x-rays there, but um, it was a cemented construct, 27. You know that thing's going to fail, and you know it's going to fail uh, in uh, yeah, I many pounds on it. So how long is it going to be? Um, this is another post-traumatic knee uh, with this uh, type 1 tibia that we just heard about. And I think this may be uh, the better way uh, to go in terms of achieving uh, a long-lasting interface and, and hopefully uh, an excellent result over time. So again, the goals are to extend implant longevity through improved fixation technologies. Uh, we've heard uh, some of the things that I think can have the promise of doing that. And I think that this approach can facilitate our, uh, our minimally invasive uh, uh, muscle sparing approaches. I think this uh, type of material can incorporate some things that will help us uh, achieve uh, better results, uh, both short and long term. Um, and I think that uh, the potential is there for total knee uh, to mimic what's occurred in, in total hips um, in terms of the preponderance of uh, cementless fixation. So certainly anytime you say something like that, you always have to worry about the cost of things um, and uh, meeting uh, the needs of, of our patients and ourselves and our hospitals and our uh, insurance companies and our, our government uh, <coughs> watchers. Um, but this new technology, I think, can, can be something that uh, is in our armamentarium and can uh, help us do our job better and, and do better for our patients. So thank you.